So welcome to an introduction to logarithms. And so what I want to do today is talk a little bit about the theory behind logarithms. You know, what are logarithms? Why do we care about them? Why are they useful? What kind of properties do we have? And how do we prove these properties? So the first thing is that they allow us to discuss objects that span many orders of magnitude. And the second more advanced is they help us linearize many nonlinear functions, calculus becomes available. A straight line is very easy to understand. If you can convert a complicated function to a straight line, things are much better. So this is one of my favorite you know, pictures. You, know, you see a picture of the sun and the earth and the moon drawn to scale. You know, here is that little dot is the earth. This little dot over here is the moon. A lot of these smudges are actually sunspots and activity like that. Although some of them are probably just dust on either my screen or the projector over here. And it's interesting that the dust and whatnot is a similar size, if not larger, than the moon over here. And so, how do you talk about quantities simultaneously that span so many orders of magnitude when there's such a huge distance between them? So, let's just quickly review what logarithms are. Hopefully, you've seen this before in high school. If we have x equals b to the y, we call b the base. That means we need y powers of b to get x. And so we'll say that the log of x base b is y. So it's the number of powers of b we need to get x. In high school, we often use log to be the logarithm base 10. We have 10 fingers on our hand, and that's why we like to work base 10. I cannot prove that the universe doesn't care that we have 10 fingers, but it's not an unreasonable assumption. And you can ask, well, what basis might the universe care about? Natural ones are, well, not surprising, the natural log base E, which comes in calculus and is very useful, e is about 2.718. And another one is base two, which computers love, or hexadecimal base 16. On, off, yes, no, true, false. It's very easy to build systems that are binary. So to just give a few examples, let's calculate a couple of logarithms. So again, the log of x base b equals y means we need b powers of y to get x. So if I take the number 100, I can write 100 as 10 squared. So the log of 100 base 10 equals 2. If we were to calculate the log of 100 base e, it would be about 4.6. And if you think about it, e is a little bit less than 3. 3 squared is 10. So if I need so many powers of 10, I'll need at least twice as many powers of e, because e squared is less than nine, and you know nine is coming from almost like you know, two powers of three. So you know having four point six is not an unreasonable answer for the natural log of one. If I want to take what is the log of one? Well, one is ten to the zero, and so the log of one base ten is zero. In fact, in any bit, the log of one is always going to be zero. You know, any number that's not zero raised to the zero power is one. For the last one, let's take point zero zero one. If I want to just you know, play with the notation, I move the decimal point once, twice, three times, one times 10 to the negative three. So this is just 10 to the negative three. And so the log of point zero zero one base 10 would just be negative three. And similar to what we found before, if I do the base e, it'd be about negative 6.9. So to give you some example, here is a picture that spans more than 40 orders of magnitude. We have adjusted it so that a you know, human being size on the order of a meter is adjusted to be zero. And then we are looking at going smaller, down to about 10 to the negative 15 for the diameter of nuclear particles, and then going all the way up to you know, the diameter of the Milky Way, 10 to the 21, distance to the farthest photographed galaxy, 10 to the 25. And when you think about how many orders of magnitude this span, to have all of them displayed simultaneously is amazing. To be able to talk about things going from the subatomic all the way to between galaxies. Okay, so where have you seen logarithms in practice? Hopefully you've seen them with the Richter scale. Hopefully not personally, and just things you've read about, but when you measure the strength of an earthquake, we use the logarithmic scale, the Richter scale. And every time you increase by one, it's 10 times worse than the previous. So this plot is great. It shows you the number of earthquakes per year as the thickness. And as you go higher and higher and higher, it's a larger value in the Richter scale. So to put things in perspective, you know, a moderate lightning bolt is maybe around a 
Oklahoma City bombing is around a three, a large lightning bolt a little bit over three, tornado a little bit less than five, the Hiroshima atomic bomb is around a six, Mount St. Helena is a little bit less than an eight, largest nuclear test is around an eight, uh, worst earthquake ever is a little bit less than 10. And it just really puts things in perspective. Every time you go up, this is a factor of 10 worse. And you can get a sense of just how bad some of these earthquakes are. Another place where you might have seen a logarithmic scale of pH, if you've done some chemistry, except that's not the slide I'm showing. I switched the order. All right, is noise levels. My kids gave some input as to the order to do this. And so if you are doing leaves rustling, soft musical whisper, that's around 30. Most of myself and my colleagues when we lecture, uh, maybe somewhere between 60, maybe a little bit louder when we're trying to emphasize the point, but hopefully we don't get up to the painful decibel levels of, you know, leaf blowers, sporting events, star car races, gunshots, siren at 100 feet. You know, hopefully we're avoiding something like that. But, you know, again, this is a logarithmic scale. Now, I don't think this is the same logarithmic scale as the Richter, where if you move up one unit, it's a factor of 10. So I will leave it as an exercise for you to just research and figure out just how much you need to move up for it to be you know, an order of magnitude more. Right, the last is the pH scale, where we've set water to be seven. And then as you get smaller and smaller and smaller, it's more acidic. It is possible to have a pH value below zero, but there's some interesting challenges in trying to actually measure this, at least from the standard lab. And as you get higher and higher and higher, these are the more basic stuff. Okay, so again, just to recall the definition of logarithm, if x equals b to the y, it means we need y powers of b to get x, so the log of x base b is equal to y. And so let's just do a couple of plots. So I'm going to plot three different functions, 2 to the x, e to the x, and 10 to the x. And we can see it's getting very hard to show all of them on one plot. You know, 10 to the x is growing much, much faster than 2 to the x. When x equals 3, 2 to the x is 8, but 10 to the x is already a 1,000. And it gets worse the larger they are. Now, all three functions agree at one special point. When x equals 0, 2 to the 0, e to the 0, 10 to the 0, they're all 1. And then when you go below 0, they flip. So when x is greater than zero, the 10 to the x is growing fast. And it's the largest one. When you're below zero, 10 to the negative one is one tenth, two to the negative one is one half. One half is much larger than one tenth. And so they flip on the other side. We can plot the logarithm. So this is plotting the logarithm base b of x for b equals two e and 10. And now we see they flip as to which one is on top. Well, that makes sense. If I'm looking at the log of x base 2, I'm going to need more copies of 2 to get a number than I will need copies of 10. You know, 2 cubed is 8, which is less than 10. So I'm going to need a little bit more than three times the number of powers of 2 to get a number as I would powers of 10. And when you look at the plots, you can see something similar to that. We also have a nice property that gives you a sense of the size of a number. If x is between 10 to the n and 10 to the n plus 1, then the log of x base 10 will be between n and n plus 1. And again, we talked about how logarithms allow us to look at objects across many different orders of magnitude. They also allow us to linearize functions. So here's a plot of the 100 most populous cities. And then if we take a, do a log log plot, which we'll talk about in a little bit later, you can see that this initial curve, which is strange to us, it's not one of the curves we have familiarity with, is replaced with a straight line. And a straight line, we understand, you can use a straight line to predict and to extrapolate. If you want to try to estimate what will things be in the future, if I have a straight line, that's very easy to continue. Okay, so why do we care about logarithms? Well, let's look at the functions x to the fourth, x squared, x to the one half root of x, and x to the one quarter, the fourth root of x. So I'm trying to plot all of them, and I'm going to just plot all the values up to 10. Well, if I look at 10 to the fourth, that's, that's 10,000. 10 squared is 100. It's just really visible on this plot that this is a little bit above the x-axis. The square root of x and the fourth root of x, I can't even see. And so again, it's very hard to see some of these curves together because they have such different growth rates. If I look 
over here and just look at x squared and x to the one half, I can just barely see x to the one half you know, on that same plot. If we take logarithms, however, it becomes much easier to view all of them simultaneously. And so now I'm going to plot the log base 10 of x to the r for one fourth, one half, two, and four. And now you can see going all the way up to 10,000, I can visualize all of them. I could do not just a log plot, but a log log plot. So rather than plotting the log of my function, the log of x to the r, I could plot the log of y versus the log of my infant. And over here, they all become straight lines. And again, this is the power of doing a log log transform rather than plotting x, y, plot like the log of x, log of y. All right. So before we state the log laws, I want to just quickly review exponent laws. And so the exponent laws all give rise to rules of logarithms. This is similar in calculus to limit laws give rise to rules for differentiation. So what are the exponent laws? The first is if I have m powers of b and I multiply by uh, b to the n, I have m plus n powers of b. If I have m powers of b and I divide by b to the n, I'll have b to the m minus n powers. And the last is if I have b to the m and I raise that to the nth power, I get b to the m x. I'm going to do all of this when m and n are integers. It's a little bit interesting. If they're not integers, what do we even mean by saying two to the square root of five? What does that mean? I'm not going to worry about that. Let's just assume m and n are integers. So as an example of why these are probably true, 10 cubed times 10 squared. Well, 10 cubed is 10 times 10 times 10. 10 squared is 10 times 10. And so when you collect the I now have 10, 5 times. 3 plus 2 is 5. If I look at the second one, 10 cubed divided by 10 squared, I have 3 tens, 10, 10, 10. I divide by 10 squared, 10 times 10. 3 minus 2 is 1. I have 2 of the tens below, canceling 2 of the tens above. And the last is 10 cubed squared is 10 cubed times 10 cubed. So that's 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 is 10 to the sixth. Another way to do the last one is to be lazy. Mathematicians are always lazy. So what we could do is we could say, well, once I have 10 cubed squared as 10 cubed times 10 cubed, oh, I'm in the setting of the first one. B to the n, b to the n is b to the n plus n. It's just going to be 10 to the second. So this is a common theme is to use early results to get later ones. All right, so the following are the most important rules involving logarithms. In the old days, people used to have slide rules. I never had to use the slide rule myself, but I have inherited several slide rules from engineers in my family and my wife's family. Um, I actually prefer the circular slide rules, which I think are cooler. Maybe I'll bring them in at some point. And so the way log logarithms work is it's often easier, rather than multiplying two numbers, is you calculate the logarithms, add, and then inverse. And so I'm going to talk about how you can use log laws to simplify expressions. So if x equals b to the y, remember, that means we need y powers of b to get x. So the log of x base b is y. If we have multiple quantities that we want to talk about simultaneously, I'll often use the subscript x1 to go with y1 and x2 to go with y2. And so the four rules are the following. The log base b of x to the n is n log base b of x. And just for simplicity, I'm not going to keep saying what the base is. You can do this whatever base you want. So this means the log of a power is the power times the log. The next rule is the log of a product is the sum of the logs. The log of x1 times x2 is the log of x1 plus the log of x2. Oops, uh, gotta fix that paper. Okay, so I have fixed the typo. So the log of a product is the sum of the logs. The next is the log of a quotient. The log of x1 divided by x2 is the difference of the logs, the log of x1 minus the log of x2. And then the last is the log of x base b is the log of x base c divided by the log of b base c. So this is the change of base formula. The reason this one is so powerful is that in the old days, people's jobs used to be to find logarithms and create log tables. And you would have maybe the log tables for the natural log base e, for base 10, maybe base 2. What this law tells you is you only need to calculate logarithms in one base. And if you know them in one base, by just dividing, you can get them in any other base. Or equivalently for calculators, they only need to calculate logarithms in one base and then they can immediately convert to any other. 
Okay, so these are the common log blocks. And so what I'm going to do now is give you a quick sketch of how you improve these results. So the first is the log of a power is that power times the logarithm. So let's start off with the definition. And almost all of these proofs start off with the definition. If you've proved the differentiation laws, it's the same way with those proofs. You start with the definition, you work, and you try to see how can I bring into the argument what I know and where I want to go. So the log of x base b equals y means x equals b to the y. I want to study x to the n. Well, if I have x equals b to the y and I want to study x to the n, let's just raise everything to the nth power. And then I'll get x to the n is b y to the nth power. But from the law of exponents, that's just b to the n y. And now I know if x equals b to the y, then the log of x base b is y. It's the number of powers of b I need to get x. If I tell you x to the n equals b to the n y, that's saying I need n y powers of b to get x to the n. Ah, so the log, ah, oh, the typo didn't go. A second. And so since x to the n is b to the n y, if we take the log base b of both sides, we get the log of x to the n. How many powers do we need? It's just n y. And now we substitute. Oh, y is just the log of x base b. And so that proved the first of our log laws. And we put the little square over here, means correlate demonstratum, that which was to be proven. It indicates we've reached the end of the proof. So that's the first log law, and it follows immediately from one of our exponential roots, our exponent roots. All right, so the next one is the log of a product is the sum of the logs. So now we'll use subscripts x1 and x2. So the log of x1 is y1, the log of x2 is y2. So x1 is b to the y1, x2 is b to the y2. Okay, we wanna somehow talk about the log of a product. Well, I know what x1 equals, I know what x2 equals, so let's look at x1 times x2. And so we'll have b to the y1 times b to the y2. And now we use another exponent rule to say that if we have b to the y1 times b to the y2, it's just b to the y1 plus y2. And now this is set up so that we can use the definition of the logarithm. How many powers of b do we need to get x1, x2? We just need y1 plus y2. So the log of x1, x2 is y1 plus y2. And then we substitute for what y1 and y2 are. It's the log of x1 and the log of x2. And that finishes the proof here. So again, the argument is very similar to what we did before. Again, it's following immediately from an exponent law. The last is the most interesting and the hardest of them, the change of base formula. So if you know logs in one base, you know logs in all bases. So we start off with the log of x base b is y. That means x equals b to the y. And then I'm going to introduce two more letters, u and v, to try to understand what's going on. And since we have the log of x base c, it's not unreasonable to write x as c to the u for some number u. You know, I have three quantities in play. I have the log of x base b, I have the log of x base c, and I have the log of b base c. So let's write something down for all of them. So I'll choose some number u, and I'll write x as u powers of c. And I've got the log of b base c, so I'll write b as v powers of c. And now I want to try to combine these. Well, I know x is b to the y, and I know b equals c to the v. So it suggests maybe I should substitute for b as c to the v, that that might be a good thing to do. And so if I write x equals b to the y is c to the v to the y. Okay, so we have x is b to the y, b is c to the v, so we have c to the v y. Well, we can now take the logarithm of x base c. You know, how many powers of c do we need to get x? It's just b times y. So uh, since x equals c to the u and x equals c to the v, that means u has to be v times y. So that means y has to equal u divided by v. And so when you substitute for what u equals and what v equals, u is the log of x base c, v is the log of v base c, and u is just the log, I'm sorry, and y is just the log of x base b. When you substitute in, we get our final result. So again, it all follows from just doing some algebra 
And the difficulty is figuring out which expressions to look at. How can I write things in a way to make the calculations meaningful? All right, one last thing to just look at to just get a sense of how logarithms help us study large objects. Let's look at n factorial, which is the number of ways to order n objects in order matters. So three factorial, three times two times one is six. Four factorial, four times three times two times one is 24. This function is growing very rapidly. So I'm gonna look at the first 200 values. And if you plot the first 200 values, you know, it just shoots up so rapidly. It's really hard to see this. You know, when, you're, when you're over 100, every time you increase n by one, you're moving up more than two full orders of magnitude. And it's tough to see all of this on one graph at the same time. But if I plot not n factorial against n, but the log of n factorial against n, you can see now I can actually get them all on the same screen. It doesn't look like there's that much of a difference, but you have to remember these are exponents. You know, this is e to the 800 versus e to the 400. Huge difference. The next one is rather than just plotting the log of n factorial against n, I could plot the log of n factorial against the log of n. And that will also compress my x-axis in terms of you know, the size of quantities. So the whole point of all of this today was to just give you a sense of you know, what logarithms are, what's the definition, why are they useful? They allow us to discuss things that span numerous orders of magnitude. They linearize many functions that are not linear. So when you're trying to do data analysis and you're trying to extrapolate, you now have a curve that you understand. We understand a straight line. This is the key geometric object, the key function we want to reduce everything to. And a straight line is very easy to continue, whereas the other curves are much higher. Okay, so this is a good place to start. Okay.